Um, I know I'm being extremely timely, absolutely on the dot of 2.30. I think it's a good precedent to set. Um, let's get going. Hello, everyone. I'm Moji Anderson, um, anthropologist and senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work. And I want to welcome you all to the panel discussion entitled, The Queen is Dead, Long Live the Queen, Exploring Jamaican Responses to the Death of the Queen. So thank you to everyone who has taken time out of their day to listen to us. So I'm gonna give a little bit of context, although I suspect it might not, in fact, I'm so sorry, I meant to have my video on all this time, uh, forgive me. Um, give a little bit of context, although I suspect it's not really that necessary, but Queen Elizabeth II died on September the 8th um, of this year. And that death, of course, made waves across the globe. So responses ranged from unadulterated glee, and I have to say Irish Twitter was beside itself, but then also ranged from unadulterated glee to deep sadness. While some talked about her complicity in theft and genocide as head of state of an imperialist power, like South Africa's economic freedom fighters, describing her as head of an institution built up, sustained, and living off a brutal legacy of dehumanization of millions of people across the world, others praised the steady hand she lent her country over her decades long reign with the Australian Prime Minister calling her a rare and reassuring constant amid rapid change, who through the noise and tumult of the years embodied and exhibited a timeless decency and an enduring calm. As we all know, the monarchy has been a frequent topic of discussion in Jamaica this year. Uh, while some Jamaicans were happy to see the Prince and Princess of Wales in March, others protested demanding reparations and the move to Republican status. The fraught visits made for some awkward moments as the prime minister told the royals that Jamaica intended to move on to become an independent country. It might have come to, uh, as a surprise then when he announced in the wake of the queen's death that Jamaica would have a longer mourning period than Great Britain itself. So in light of all that has happened this year in 2022, this seems the perfect time to have a frank conversation about the monarchy and Jamaica's relationship to it. How did Jamaicans respond to Queen Elizabeth's death? What do these re reactions tell us about Jamaican identity? Should Jamaica take advantage of this moment to push for or push harder, let's say, for Republican status? So this is what the first in the full department seminar series, FESS, of the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work is about. So SPSW, meaning department staff, one of our graduate students and our special invited guest, Professor Rosalie Hamilton, founder of the Institute of Law and Economics, will provide perspectives on this key historical moment. So the way it's gonna work is that we'll listen to each speaker for about between 10 and 15 minutes. And then after everyone has spoken, we'll open up the floor to questions from the audience. So please feel free to post questions in the chat. And I believe you can also raise your hand and I can ask you to um, ask you to ask to ask your question. And before we get started, let me just give a shout out to the New Zealand posse who is in attendance. And I fully expect to see some kind of um, comments coming from the New Zealand situation as well as we get into our Q&A session. So welcome. So first, we'll hear from our special invited guest, as I said before, that's Professor Rosalie Hamilton. Over the past 30 years, Professor Hamilton has given voice to the voiceless through her advocacy to support micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, or MSMEs, as we know, to eliminate gender-based violence, to protect human rights, and to improve good governance. She is the founding director of the Institute of Law and Economics and is currently involved in philanthropy, climate activism, Pan-African trade, and Republican advocacy through the Advocates Network. So Prof Hamilton, over to you, please. Thank you so much for having me. You know, um, let me just start by saying, you know, I, I saw the death of the queen as the end of an era of whitewashing, the central role of the royal family in the pillage, kidnapping, genocide, colonial domination, and slavery of millions 
of people across the world. You know what UN has called crimes against humanity. I think that point ought not to be missed. The genie is in fact out of the bottle in the wake of the death and even before with the royal visits, the international publicity that are crit was critical to the monarchy seemed to have lifted the veil of secrecy that had persisted for decades. You know, when we talk about the monarchy, there was always a good feel, but we heard a barrage of critical kinds of um, conversation about the monarchy. And it amplified public education about the atrocities of the British Empire. So thanks to social media, the world is now awoke to the more than 400 years of British atrocities and inhumanity. It, it has been an amazing lesson for all of us. I, I, you know, one of the things I noted and I, as I walked around Jamaica, I kept asking Jamaicans, did you know that the monarchy had a direct role and financially benefited from the trafficking and enslavement of Africans? Many, many Jamaicans didn't know. The Royal African Company, owned by the Royal Stuart family, played a pivotal role, had a monopoly for nearly a hundred years in trafficking and enslaving our ancestors. Most Jamaicans didn't know that 20 million pounds was paid in compensation to slave owners and their ancestors, and these payments ended in 2015. In fact, Jamaicans who migrated to the UK and paid taxes up to 2015 were contributing to these payments of, uh, you know, of, uh, um, these are payments that were made, of course, to the ancestors up to that point of the slave owners. Now, this includes students like me who studied and worked in London in the 1970s and, and others, you know. So inadvertently, um, we, we, we are contributing to this atrocity. Now, the public exposure of the enormous wealth created by companies and churches and universities and so on have all bolstered the conversation about reparatory justice and republicanism. But, but it's not a piece of history, I think, that you know, just sits in the history books. It's directly linked to our reality today. Um, that the legacies that persist through mental slavery, we talk about that all the time, but through actual institutions and cultural habits that perpetuate the problems we see today. So for example, it's evident in the school system. It was founded on a very elitist um, educational premise. Only a few needed education. We have a school system today in which education inequality is a reality. And it reproduces the kind of conforming behavior that ensures that students fit into the status quo. Not question, not challenge, not try to find creative solutions to our problems. That's what we need. Recently, we heard about what was happening in Clifton. The inherited structure of land ownership perpetuates landlessness, homelessness, squatting. Um, we've seen repeatedly the demolition of homes by the state. This is not new. This has been going on for decades. Today, six, over 600,000 Jamaicans are living as squatters. And perhaps the most obvious legacy, of course, is that today we have a foreign head of state. You know, the, the 10 days of, the 12 days of um, state mandated mourning was a joke for many people. But in fact, it was a big inconvenience and in fact, a waste of taxpayers' money when there are offices that were closed and were not able to deliver some of the needed services that Jamaicans wanted. You know, we're supposed to be independent, but we have this kind of undemocratic head of state that's now imposed on us, Charles III, and we have no choice. And when he dies, we'll get a new head of state. So much for our democracy. We're busy changing titles, KC, UC, what all these sees, and following protocols that have absolutely nothing to do with the real problems that Jamaica faced today. So, so many are really asking, you know, are there benefits to this monarchical arrangement? And I, I just noticed this week it was where the Ghanaians, the news is now out that the Ghana who ditched the monarch from 1970, right? They now can go to the UK visa free. 
imagine we have a head of state and um, from, from Britain and we're not entitled to that visa free access. In fact, 17 of the independent countries um, in the Commonwealth um, that have the, Brit the, the, the monarchy as head of state, Jamaica is the only country in which the nationals need visa to enter and to transit. We need a visa to access our final court of appeal. This is where we want to defend our rights and freedoms. We need a visa. Um, it's really absurd. In fact, the governor general who represents our head of state needs a visa to visit the UK to represent Jamaica and to do the um, monarch's business and to act on their behalf. So when we look at all of this, we really have to ask the question, having gathered the information, it's now clear, it's all over the internet, we have this information, what do we do on it? Do we bury it as just historical information that, you know, it's there, that's history, let's forget that and move on, or do we act on it? Well, for, for many of us in the Advocates Network, we have chosen to act. The death of the queen has escalated our advocacy towards a republic and has intensified our focus on reparatory justice. You know, the idea of a re republic has caused, caused some confusion. Um, many people don't see this as linked to their day-to-day -day reality. You know, how will it improve my standard of living? How will it address the problems I face? I have written about these and in the interest of time, I won't get into a lot of detail. I can drop the link in the chat. But the key thing to note is that the conception of, of a republic that really matters is the form of government in where, which the nation belongs to the people, where, where the people are sovereign. That's the conception that matters for us. The idea that a republic is a government without a, a, a monarch as head of state is just not enough. That's important. We have to get rid of a foreign monarch that's a head of state. But when we look at what the rest of the Caribbean did, um, Dominica, who you know, settled this matter at independence, Ghana, Trinidad and Tobago, and most recently Barbados, the head of change in the head of state was the focus. It perpetuated the inherited centralized structure of government, and that remained. And what it did was provide no effective oversight or constraint on executive action. And we want our representatives in parliament to represent us. And in so doing, if necessary, challenge executive decision that doesn't reflect the will of the people. And importantly, there's no um, systematic, organized routine mechanism for citizens to get involved in policymaking. And so for us, the Republic requires two key elements, mechanisms on the one hand to enable our representatives to hear our voice, to understand our will and to act in our interests. It also involves these constitutional changes and legal changes and policy changes. It's not all constitutional changes, but all of these legal frameworks that are necessary to put these mechanisms in place. Mechanisms like having regular town halls, um, you know, parliamentary hearings, we have impeachment and recall for corrupt politicians, um, participatory bu budgeting and other kinds of arrangements in which the Jamaican people can be heard and our voices can help to shape the decisions that affect us. We also, of course, have to replace the monarch as head of state. And we need a head of state that can truly reflect the will of the Jamaican people. Um, these are the kind of conversations we need to have. There's been discussions about whether we have a ceremonial or executive head of state, but those kinds of conversations are absolutely necessary as we chart our future. So we know that since January, the Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs was established with an explicit objective to reform the constitution and to transition Jamaica from a constitutional monarch to a republic. And of course, we know the famous statements by our prime minister, we're moving on. In June of this year, at her sectoral presentation in parliament, 
the Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs, Minister Malahu Ford, established and made, 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 clear, made, made, made a promise actually to establish the Constitutional Reform Commission. Now, this Constitutional Reform Committee, um, we've heard nothing about. We've, we've heard it mentioned, but we've not heard who comprises the committee. We've not heard in terms of reference. There's been silence. Um, in that context, we feel that we need to step up the advocacy, demand the establishment of this committee. Constitutional change is important. We need to, and, and this of course will take time, but the public needs to be informed about what this will take. And importantly, how we will get involved in reforming the constitution to make sure that we create a constitution that's a living document that we all know that puts in place the rules that define our relationship with our representatives and more. The minister also agreed that public education is important. Again, we've heard nothing. We think that we have to push for a public education process that informs Jamaica about what it will take to become a republic, what the referendum will look like, what is that process? And the importance, of course, of changing our constitution as part of this transition to a republic. You know, we, through the Advocates Network, have started our own public education series, and I'm glad to hear that um, your department and UWI is engaged in a series, and I'm happy, of course, to be part of it. Um, and our series, we've been collect, col um, collaborating with, the, with JAM, the Jamaica Accountability Meter Portal, and the Institute of Law and Economics, and the series is called Our Jamaican Republic, and the fourth in that series will be held on October 31st, and it will be entitled King Charles III, Change or Continuity in Jamaica. So I urge you to come. We also have a face-to-face -face, um, element of it, not only online, um, and so I want to urge you all to, to, to join. Now, it's also important that we push for the tabling of the required legislative bill to remove the king as head of state. And we need to do that before our next independence. Imagine 61 years and we still have a king, a monarch as head of state. So I want to say in closing that the advocacy that's required to create a republic that can truly reflect the will of the people will require the self-confidence and the activism of the Jamaican people. Jamaicans, we need to see ourselves as really owners of this country. We can't be talking about people's sovereignty when we don't see ourselves as the owners. We can't give up that to someone else, right? We own Jamaica. The road to the Republic must also lead to the improved institutional arrangements that can empower Jamaicans to address the problems that we face and to improve our standard of living. It will take work. It will not happen overnight. And it's these key institutions, the educational institutions, health, innovation, creativity, uh, global competitiveness, governance arrangements, all of this must be enhanced for us to affect our standard of living. It will require public education, meaningful dialogue to understand what this republican path will entail, ought to entail, and what we want it to entail. I see it as part of Jamaica's 528 year long journey to freedom. If we see this as part of a legacy of freedom fighters led by our national heroes and other unsung heroes that have been pushing for a better Jamaica for decades, we must join that fight. And I think that if we see it through that lens, we recognize that this is about creating a better society. It's not simply a, a, a label in which you tick boxes and say, yes, we've become a republic. We, we must fight, we must keep you know, along this path that was set by our ancestors. And I think if we do that, this is the best way I think we can honor the legacy of our national heroes we've just celebrated 
um, that um, special National Heroes Day. And I think if we follow in our footsteps, that's the best way to honor them. Thank you so much for having us, for having me. Thank you, Prof Hamilton. That was a real call to action. And I think we really need to take note. Um, I, I want to move on now to Michael Barnett, who's our next speaker. Let me just introduce him to everyone. He's senior lecturer in our department, sociology, psychology, and social work, specializing in African diaspora studies, critical race theory, and sociological theory. He's published several articles and books on the Rastafari movement and was awarded an Ethiopian order of knighthood in 2017, something I did not know until this very moment, Michael, by the Ethiopian Crown Council. So please go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Moji. And I must um, take the opportunity to say big ups to Dr. Rosalie Hamilton for her work with the Advocate Network and um, great, great stuff, great work that you're doing. And I just want to really make the point that although um, I consider myself an Ethiopian royalist, I am not a British royalist. And I'll make, uh, I'll, I'll ex expound on the significance of that a bit later. But what I wanna say is essentially with, with the death of Queen Elizabeth II, um, the argument that an era really has truly come to an end and uh, the discussions have resounded as to whether King Charles III will have the same immense charm and diplomatic wear it all as that of the late queen. And uh, we will, it's a watch and see situation. But what I wanna emphasize on is that the um, legacy of the British monarchy should be seen through the lens of his existence as an institution in and of itself, rather than as individual, rather than as individual monarchs. So I'm making this presentation on the basis of the British monarchy as an institution and not getting into personality issues. And my argument or, or perspective is that um, England has the uncontestable um, distinction, uncontested distinction of, of really spreading the odious fumes of slavery, colonialism and empire. And I wanna point out that England has the uncontested distinction of conquering and colonizing more nations and territories than any other colonizing power in the world. And that's actually a legacy uh, many, many British are proud of, I should tell you. Um, so vast and wide spanning was the British empire at its height that the mantra that the sun could never set on the British empire was in fact very true, was in fact very true because in fact, um, the sun is always shining on, on at least one of the British territories um, during its peak, during its height. Um, and as Dr. Hamilton mentioned, the British monarchy was, as an institution, was very uh, complicit in the enslavement and trafficking of, of Africans. And in fact, um, as she sort of mentioned briefly, um, we can look at Queen Elizabeth I, um, and, and Charles II, which I think is sort of paradoxical considering that we have just had a transition between Queen Elizabeth II and now King Charles III. So if we look at the, um, from Queen Elizabeth I, what actually happened was that she publicly supported Captain John Hawkins um, in his expedition in 1562 um, of trading in, in enslaved Africans, <clears throat> excuse me. So in 1562, John Hawkins, um, he captured, violently captured from Sierra Leone, I should, I should point out, 300 enslaved Africans, and he trafficked them to South America and traded them for hides, ginger, and sugar from the then Spanish Americans, Spanish Americas, sorry. His triangular trade proved to be so lucrative that Queen Elizabeth I sponsored all of his subsequent journeys, providing ships, supplies, and guns. He was also knighted 
and provided with a unique coat of arms by Queen Elizabeth I, which bared the illustration of a bound slave, which I think was very interesting. So the three major slavery expeditions that Sir John Hawkins engaged in during the 1560s can be credited for England's entrance into the triangular slave trade, because the Spanish and the Portuguese preceded the slave trading um, of the British. Um, so Queen Elizabeth I, I argue, undeniably played a significant role here. Then when we come years later to King Charles II and his brother, who was then Duke of York, who would later go on to become King James II, they played an even more direct role in the transatlantic slave trade by founding and establishing the Royal African Company in 1660. Now the Royal African Company, which was formally chartered by King Charles II, was particularly prolific in its involvement in the slave trade from 1672 to 1731, where it is estimated that at least 187,000 enslaved Africans had been transported by the company from Africa to much of the Americas, the so-called New World, um, if you like. As a matter of fact, the Royal African Company held a monopoly on British enslaving endeavors during its entire lifetime, which was from 1660 to 1752, okay? And having said that, this guaranteed King Charles II and subsequently as well, um, King James II um, and all subsequent British monarchs during that period of time anyway, whatever share of the profits they desired. The profits generated by the African Royal Company were abundant. And while it is difficult to estimate exactly how much of the royal family's wealth came directly from the slave trade, what we can say for certain, and, and in no, you know, with, without a, a, any, any um, limitations, is that there was financial gain, considerable financial gain made by the British monarchy from the slave trade. Hence the argument can be made very easily that reparation demands can be made directly to the British monarchy and not just to the British government. So not just on the basis that the British monarchy symbolically heads the state of Britain, but also as an institution in and of itself, they have directly profited from the trade in enslaved Africans, irregardless of the much vaunted charm, diplomacy, diplomacy and personal attributes of any of its recent members. So that's something I think that we need to consider. There is also, very importantly, as I said briefly before, Britain's legacy of colonialism and empire that needs to be considered. And the British empire was composed of dominions, colonies, protectorates, and other territories. At its height, as I said, the British Empire was the largest empire in history and for over a century was the foremost global power. According to various sources, it was at, at the start of 1914, just before World War I, the British Empire held sway over 412 million people, just 23% of the world population at that time. And by 1920, the British Empire covered um, 35.5 million square kilometers, which is equivalent to 13.7 square miles. But importantly, that is 24% of the Earth's total land mass, 24% of the Earth's total land mass. So that's quite a legacy. So um, as a result, it should be no surprise that England's constitutional and legal and linguistic and cultural legacy is very widespread even today. You know, that's why English is so widely spoken across the world because of the vastness of the British Empire. So while England, though, importantly benefited materially from its plunder and conquest of various nations across the world, we have to ask what about the natives and the residents of these acquired territories? Now, a key justifying ideology that England gave for its aggressive colonization and conquest project for much of the world is that along with that came civilization the benefits of civilization. And the people who were colonized, as well as those who were enslaved, were taught that their assimilation into a culturally superior empire was a distinct benefit for them. One that ultimately, ultimately made up for any perceived exploitation at all. So as a result, it's not surprising that we sometimes hear the mantra, thank God for slavery, or thank God for colonialism, 
from the descendants of the formerly colonized enslaved. And I've heard those mantras right here in Jamaica. And this is, we attribute this to the mental slavery syndrome or what we would call the roast breadfruit syndrome. All right. So that legacy of colonialism has made its mark. It, it still lingers with us. Um, and so that is something that needs to be addressed within this school curriculum, as Dr. Hamilton um, you know, mentioned in her presentation. You know, somehow we have to, to decolonize the minds. So we have a lot of work ahead of us in terms of the decolonization project. So not only do we have the case of reparations for all of the wealth that was extracted from Jamaica and the rest of the so-called new world, but we have the project of decolonizing our institutions, many of which are, are, are bereft with uh, colonialism, and we have to decolonize our minds. So that is not gonna be an easy task. And removing the British monarchy as our head of state is part of the answer to that process. So I am in uh, firm support of the Republicanist drive. I think it's a necessary thing. We have to cut the umbilical cord that we have with the so-called mother country, England. We have to do that if we want to become truly independent. So even though we celebrate this year our 60th anniversary and it's a jubilee year of independence this year, 2022, in reality, we're not fully dependent. In, we're not fully independent, sorry. So we have to take that on board and we have to consider that. And we will not be fully independent until we cut the umbilical cord, which one of which is, is removing the British monarch, whoever it may be, as our head of state. Okay? And so republicanism is the way forward in doing that. But as Dr. Hamilton said, we need a, a, a public educational program to make many of the Jamaican populace aware of this perspective, because I don't think people are necessarily thinking about this. And I'm very glad that Dr. Hamilton mentioned the issue of visas. You know, I, for one, was kind of taken aback, but I shouldn't have been um, in 2002 slash 2003 when the visa um, situation um, was imposed on Jamaicans. And the argument was that there's so many uh, Jamaicans coming into England and practicing criminality, and we had the so-called Yardi um, syndrome going on in England at the time. I spent a little time in England, so I was aware of that mood in the country, and most of gun crime was down to Jamaicans, and we have to limit the flow of Jamaicans into the country. And no mention was made of the high, um, the, the contributions, the great contributions the Windrush generation made to England, right? The Windrush generation, many of who were Jamaicans um, in terms of the population, obviously you had other Caribbean nationals as well coming in England, but actually helped to rebuild England after World War II. And where is the um, acknowledgement they've gotten for that? I mean, we just recently had the, the Windrush scandal that we know about um, in two seven, two, um, 2018, it really came to light, actually. You know, um, paradoxically, um, some 70 odd years since uh, the ship Windrush sailed from the shores of Jamaica, um, 1948. So what we see is this paradox where Caribbean nationals and former British colonial subjects have made such a great contribution to rebuilding England, you know, working on the underground, working on, uh, on the railways, um, working um, nurses, many of the nurses, many of the women came in and, 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 and supported and beefed up um, the hospitals and, and the medical um, institutions in England. And what thanks do they get? Um, except that, okay, um, you know, we need to get rid of some of you and, and, and ferry you back to um, Jamaica or wherever it is in the Caribbean that you were considered to go. So we know um, that there were a lot of politics involved um, in ferrying much of the Windrush generation back to um, what was seen as their homelands, um, basically um, 
you know, involuntarily. That's important. In many cases, their landing cards, which they came in to England with, mysteriously disappeared or were destroyed. And, and there was a lot going on in the background. And of course, um, it's not just a conspiracy. Facts have come up that there was a deliberate attempt to create a hostile environment for those people who didn't have all their paperwork together, although there was proof that they had come into England um, in a legal manner and to contribute to the country's economy. Um, so we have to do something about the deportees that are just coming over to Jamaica and it's unquestioned. Many of them, you know, leaving Jamaica at the age of four or three or whatever, not having any relatives out here. Many of them having established their own families in England and you're torn away and you're deported to Jamaica without any um, ground or foundation to stand on. Why? Because there's a drive to rid the country of people of color. I'm not going to go into that. I could go on and on about that. But basically what I want to say and I, and I want to highlight is that all said and done, Britain did benefit materially from its colonies by extracting more wealth and resources than they have ever returned. And this is something that, interesting enough, um, Sir Hilary Beckles' book, How Britain Underdeveloped the British Caribbean, which he just um, published this year, highlights. So it's an extraction process. And the big question is, is what is Jamaica getting out of this linkage with England? How is it materially benefiting, if anything else? Okay. And these are the questions we have to ask at this point in time and contemplate on. Okay. My okay. Um, was one, to wrap up. one last sentence, Moji. Thank you. Um, yes, for the time check. So it is by no means a trivial um, asking for reparations for slavery from Britain. It's not a trivial issue. Um, whether it would be received more favorably with the new British monarch, King Charles III, as opposed to Queen Elizabeth II, remains to be seen. Because I should just tell you the Rastafari community have made several reparation claims. They've been agitating long before the CARICOM reparations commission came into being in 2013. And they have actually written several letters um, uh, and uh, pronouncements for reparation to the Queen um, Elizabeth herself, uh, none of which have borne any fruit, I should say. So let's see if anything happens with the reign of King Charles III. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. And uh, we leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. We'll have lots of time to talk more about some of the issues you raised in the Q&A. So we're going to move on to our brave graduate students, Ashley Onroy, Onroy who agreed to um, speak with us today. So she's a graduate student in our department pursuing an MSc in sociology with an anthropology specialization. She has a BA in history and archeology span for which she received first class honors and um, in, with a minor in social anthropology. So please go ahead, Ashley. Thank you, Moji, and of course, a wonderful good afternoon to everyone present today. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this forum. Uh, my main purpose this afternoon is, of course, going to be exploring some of the sentiments permeating the youth space surrounding the passing of Queen Elizabeth II and, of course, the coronation of uh, Prince Charles III, well, sorry, King Charles. Uh, firstly, you know, the thing that we want to explore is a fundamental question. Do young people actually care about the passing of the Queen? Do young people care about Jamaica's status? Do young people actually uh, consider it necessary for Jamaica to transition into a republic or maintain the current system of government? And the simple answer to that is yes, young people care based on my interactions with several young people, based on observing social media platforms, having discussions in class settings, as well as in other forums. And we do care, although there seems to be varying levels of uh, indifference throughout the the youth space. So permeating youth space, there are different instances in which young people may have a particular uh, orientation towards this, this idea of becoming a republic towards the Queen's death. And that may stem from the fact that many Jamaican youth don't necessarily have a vested interest in the monarchy 
or the diplomatic relations between the United Kingdom and Jamaica. That may be because for a long time, by and large, the most interaction that they probably would have had with any sort of history concerning that would have been in secondary school, if it is that they did see such history, because as you know, unfortunately, history is not yet compulsory in the secondary education system, or they may have been introduced to it because they discuss it with friends, or they are closely affiliated with somebody who studies those things or somebody who pursues studies in history, for example. Uh, and, you know, based on my observations and the conversations that I've been having, for my personal benefit, I have loosely categorized some of the sentiments of the young persons into around three categories, and they're superficial or cosmetic views, uh, robust activism, and genuine concern. So when we're talking about superficial or cosmetic views, I'm referring to the typical nine-day wonder. You know how it is when something happens in, in the media or in the public space and everybody's discussing it or clamoring, right? It's just right in your face. And so you decide to formulate your opinion on it and share it continuously, but that is really short lived. And uh, I've also noticed there are varying levels of performative discomfort on social media. And that is, you know, my description of some of the things that I would have been seeing in the form of tweets or commentary on Instagram or even on WhatsApp status or even some, some blog posts that I've seen whereby persons are seemingly outraged at, you know, the legacy of colonialism, enslavement, the lack of reparations that Jamaica and other Caribbean nations that were once colonies of Britain uh, don't have or are currently experiencing. But that also only lasts for a period because interestingly, many of those persons who were very vocal about the queen, her passing, us becoming our public are notably quiet now. So that's why I've termed that as superficial or cosmetic views of some of the youth in the Jamaican space. And then we have robust activism, where there is a notable subsection of young people who are continuously engaging in discourse on reparations, the results of enslavement, or the emotional and psychological trauma that we would have inherited, generational trauma, if you may as well as the underdevelopment of our nation, Jamaica, and by extension, other West Indian countries. There is continuous conversation about them. In the social media spaces, I know some young people who actually have Zoom forums and Google Meet forums to just galvanize the interest of other young people so they can get them talking and sharing general history about things of that nature. And that is something that has been taking place far before you know, this continued discussion becoming a republic. In fact, that's something that would have been going on and based on my observation from as early as, you know, when I was in high school and there were various groups. You had um, Black student movement groups and so on and in social groups where they would discuss this. And it seems to be that the Queen's passing has definitely amplified the, the urgency or the perceived urgency of making sure that Jamaica is a republic and shedding as best as possible any remnants of colonialism that we have currently in the society. And then you have the young people who, uh, as far as they're concerned, are showing or displaying, illustrating genuine emotion and concerns towards the end of feeling um, deeply saddened, very disturbed, kind of, you know, emotionally unsettled, bawling, crying their eyes out even, in fact, I had a personal experience in which one of my acquaintances, when he heard the passing of uh, the queen, he just, he couldn't continue for the rest of the day. He was literally in shambles. And personally, I couldn't understand that because, you know, he not related to any direct ties there. So upon investigation or really starting to analyze all the things that are happening in the youth space, some of that concern or some of those empathetic reactions towards the queen's death could very well stem from the glamorization of the monarchy, as well as the illustration of the British monarchy as being some sort of a savior, doing the Caribbean and Jamaican and other former colonies a huge, a huge favor, actually, by supporting them educationally with scholarships and so on. And there's a lot of pro-colonial propaganda in very popular TV shows and series and um, YouTube videos. So I think by and large, the information that is gathered from those spaces could influence the subset of young people who are deeply saddened and traumatized by, uh, well, their words, traumatized by the passing of the queen and, of course, the um, coronation of the king.
uh, things to note too in terms of young people's sentiments. There are some very interesting comments as a history student or somebody who studied history at the uh, undergraduate level and archaeology. I typically engage in discourse of this nature on my social media platforms and persons tend to view me as being very pro-Black. I've been told since the Queen's passing that I need to not be so Black, cut down on my Blackness. So there's a little bit of anti-Blackness sentiments. And yes, that is coming from Jamaican young people who are saying that not everything is about Blackness and not everything is about national identity. I need to step out of that and just recognize it for what it is that, you know, Auntie Lizzie, as some of them have very weirdly affectionately referred to the former queen as Aunt Lizzie has passed. And so we, we should be sad about that. But truthfully, I have learned to, and other persons, other young people who are of a, a opposite sentiment have probably learned to excuse the perceived ignorance um, of such statements as an indication of the level of exposure that a Jamaican young person would have had to um, the history surrounding our establishment as a nation on the foundations on which we were developed or, you know, arguably underdeveloped, you know, the legacy of colonialism, enslavement, the disenfranchisement that we would have experienced, and of course, the generational trauma that we're going through. And I think, again, that is because at the secondary level um, of education, when we're talking about history, by and large, we tend to refer to history or, or enslavement the period of enslavement in history as something that just happened for that context. And we don't really delve into the remnants of enslavement and colonialism and how quite literally it permeates every single facet of our Jamaican society. And going forward, I think it is extremely important for us as a nation to have increased strategic public education on uh, enslavement, its remnants, colonialism, and what that has done for us as our identity, as Jamaican nationals, as Caribbean citizens, what it means for us, what it looks like in everyday society, because truthfully we harbor some sentiments that are deeply rooted in enslavement that we're not necessarily aware of because we weren't taught to think of enslavement as a systemic system or a systemic um, occurrence of atrocities against black people or um, persons of African descent that would have obviously been brought over to the Caribbean. Another thing that I think is very important is that we should make historical education compulsory in schools. And that's something that I've been using my platform to talk about for a very long time. If we have that sort of direct and focused approach to teaching all aspects of our history, including delving as deep as we can into the atrocities of enslavement and what that looks like in our society today, or the remnants of enslavement in our society today, that will definitely transform our perception of ourselves, of our nation in respect to where it is um, compared to other nations across the world who did not experience colonialism, as well as that will inform our sentiments towards the British monarchy. And um, overall, I think it's important because we need to consider the ethos of our Jamaican identity and our understanding of who we are, not just as young people, but by extension, all people, all Jamaican citizens, you know, uh, interestingly, when I was reading, I was able to assume or come up with the fact that on average, I don't think that there's, on average, I think that many Jamaicans are probably around seven to 10 generations removed from a family member who would have been in enslavement. And that says a lot, especially because many Jamaicans tend to think of enslavement as something that happened billions or, or thousands of years ago when we have not um, enslavement hasn't even been uh, abolished for 200 years. So it's that sort of thinking that I think needs to inform how we view ourselves as citizens, and of course will inform how it is that we form our sentiments related to the monarchy, and will of course galvanize even more support for our push to republicanism. And I hope that that contribution on the sentiments of young people will greatly give us context as we continue this discussion this afternoon on this topic. Thank you. Well, that was Ashley Anfroy doing the graduate population of our department. Great justice, that was fabulous work. Thank you so much. So then now we're going to, well, let me just let somebody into the, into the meeting, okay? Then now we're going to move to our final speaker who is Ms. Sophia Morgan, lecturer in our department. Um, her PhD work is on identities in a post-colonial organization and her areas of research interest are 
organizational identities, teams, team building, and positive psychology. Over to you, Sophia. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Moji. And welcome, everybody. Welcome to this hearty discussion. Uh, the queen is dead, long live the king. Um, and I would say of, of the bat, of course, why not? I, I really wish everybody a long and healthy life, but um, we're not here, of course, to um, express our well wishes to the king. And um, so we really are here to figure out what the statement really means what it means for us as a people and what we hope to accomplish in this discussion. So for me, this is a space of reflection and of sense-making. The queen is dead, so now what? So this depicts, of course, the end of her reign, but more importantly, the continuity of the monarchy. So when we say, long live the king, we are really affirming the monarchy and we are asserting our commitment to the system. But is this the way forward? Um, I, I can't answer that. I, I, I really can't answer that. What I can do, however, in my contribution to this discussion is to help us to make sense of this situation, this experience from two perspectives, from post-colonial and from identity perspectives. In fact, in my work, I bridge these two areas, typically in the work organization context. But for now, we focus on Jamaica and the Jamaican experience and the Jamaican people. So post-colonial as we may know is a very contentious term. It is typically applied in two different ways, post-colonial with a hyphen, um, which means after um, colonialism. It's here it's applied in a, in a temporal manner and after independence. And it indicates separation rather than continuity. It provides an opportunity to start anew according to, to Fanon. So post-colonial on the other hand, uh, focuses on the legacies of colonialism and the inherited deficits, the protracted influences on the society. And this involves the current resistances that we are engaged in to Western culture and to neo-imperialism. But both of these approaches advocate for a new identity. And by this, I mean a collective identity, a collective consciousness. The late uh, Professor Nettleford in his classic 1970 publication, Mirror Mirror, was very clear about what this means. He says, it's about deciphering among ourselves the questions of what are we and what do we want? So Nettleford's book painted a picture of a nation that is unsure of itself and ambivalent about its image in the face of the newfound independence. So Nettleford's book was written just in the wake of, of, of independence. So and so our mission uh, in 1962 and onward has been to forge and develop this new collective identity. A collective identity here defines a group, in this case, Jamaica, as a social agent with the capacity to act on its behalf, to chart its own path. A part of this is making tough decisions about what we want. And in this ideal, we have to answer the question, do we fully reject the colonial past as and unencouraged. In terms of an identity-based response, this would entail a kind of de-identification with the colonial. And to de-identify is to define ourselves in relation to who we are not. So define who we are by who we are not. And this involves both mental, cognitive, and emotional separation of 
Jamaica's identity from or colonial identity. So we really have made tremendous strides in this remark, in this regard. And you know, I could go on and on about the strides. But the truth is, um, this ideal that we're striving for is far from being realized. So that's why we're here arguing and contemplating long live the king. Some Caribbean theorists have argued that this kind of separation is, is not possible. I know this is a doom and gloom um, way to think about it, but they say this is because of our inability to construct a collective identity. So these are proponents of the plural society argument. And in this argument, there is the inherent danger of the inherent danger of pluralism lies in the challenge of combining identities in a way that becomes a transformative whole. So the Creole model of society is far more optimistic um, because it acknowledges the elements of our colonial past will always be with us. These elements will always be with us and they'll be core to who we are. But more importantly, it embraces the value of pluralism and it embraces that in a transformative way. So according to Brathwaite, who is one of the bigger proponents of this Creole um, approach, um, the process of creolization is a way of seeing society as a combination of both the negatives and the positives of the colonial experience. And here we capitalize on resilience and our creativity and our authenticity as we define and develop this Creole space. Um, another reason that this new identity is difficult to achieve at this um, shift um, is that this shift means a kind of disruption in the structures as we know it. Um, that is the colonial structures. The importance of structure here is that it is a foundation of identity. The absence of strong post-colonial identity structure in the absence of it, we're left hanging on to the old and this kind of disruption of structure uh, produces what post-colonial scholars call fragmented identities indicated by what we're experiencing now in disabilities uh, disorientation and self-doubt. In fact, post-colonial scholars report that identities that develop in this kind of context will never or can never achieve a full state of integration or a full sense of self, um, leading to, to, to what we propose as a healthy development of a collective. So, to establish new structures is to commit ourselves to building uh, a, an authentic Jamaican identity out of which our allegiance to the king uh, is uh, thrown out and in, of course, with the idea of, of a republic um, national. So Orlando Patterson points out that we have to build this structure in what he calls the absence of ancestral ruins. And the problem with that, of course, is that we really have no clear sense of what that is. We are indeed out of many one people with over 70% of our people, 73.6 actually, of our people of African descent. It is fair to assume that we should begin with our African uh, ancestry. But Patterson described this loss of our ancestry as um, he uses a term, natal alienation. And I like that term because the power of that concept is that it shed light on identity issues of belonging and the search for security, a kind of ontological security. So um, what I'm saying here is that a part of the reason that we have found ourselves in, in this predicament um, is that the shift from post-colonial, so from colonial, from our colonial rule to post-colonial 
has not materialized in a way that has promoted the identification with the colonial system and the construction of viable and valued collective identity. What we have instead are personal and collective identities that are riddled with tensions and conflicts and uncertainties and ambivalences. There are multiple evidences of this, of course, in relation to the issue of hand. So in my own discussions on the matter, I've encountered persons who define themselves as staunch royalists or those who say, queen, what queen? Um, so what's interesting is that persons who claim to love the queen also wants out of the system that bounds us to our colonial past. past. Of course, people are allowed to hold differing views and varying sentiments. However, here is where we can account for the deep sense of ambivalences that have defined our identities. So the concept of identity, ambivalence purports that it is possible for us to love and hate the monarchy at the same time. One of the ways we do this, of course, is by separating the person from the role. So, so here we're separating the queen from her role in the monarchy. The point here is that we should not be surprised that about the outpour of love um, for the queen and confuse it with the love for the monarchy. So a few days ago, I was watching a program, program with um, Malcolm Gladwell, who some of us know as a renowned author, best-selling author of books like Blink and Outliers and stuff. And he pointed out um, that he's of Jamaican ancestry, by the way. His mother is a, is a Jamaican. And in his interview, um, he was asked, um, about should we celebrate the queen? And his response was, if you want me to disagree, you have come to the wrong place. And of course I was taken aback by this. And he went on to say, my 91 year old Jamaican mom was very sad when the queen died. And she, he goes on to describe the queen in terms of her extraordinary grace and dignity. And he acknowledged as well that there are some things about her country that were unspeakable. So here I noted how he separated the queen from the monarchy, from the role. So just to make the point that when we think of identity, there's a sense of ambivalence that we cannot escape. There are a lot more examples as I wrap up. There are a lot more examples. I just want to draw attention to um, one in particular or, or, or two. Um, recently, we welcomed the Prince and Princess of Wales, now Cambridge. Um, it was Cambridge at the time of their visit. It's now uh, Prince and Princess of Wales. And our government extended warm welcome by way of the expenditure and the fanfare surrounding the visit. But before the visit was concluded, we collectively indicated our intentions to separate ourselves from the monarchy um, to embrace the new identity of a republic nation. Also, in just last year, 2021, our prime minister accepted an appointment to the Queen's Privy Council and this is an elite body of advisors to the British monarchy. So here we see an explicit commitment to serve the queen, now king. Also recently, uh, that is earlier this year, Jamaica's uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Kamina Johnson-Smith, launched her candidature for the post of Commonwealth Secretary General. So one Glena commenter put it, um, putting, the putting forward of Johnson Smith appears to be ironic. And of course I concur, but implicitly is in the irony are the conflicts and the tensions and ambivalences that I'm talking about here with regard to identity. So the burning question is how should we make sense of these developments um, that you know, we observe in, in the prime ministers and our foreign minister's actions, how should we make sense of that in relation to the talks concerning removing the queen or now the king as head of state, our talks about reparations for the atro atrocities of slavery. 
And so as I ponder this issue, I'm forced to make the distinction between collective and individual identities. And the question here is, is there a concern about what is good for the collective? Or is the concern what is good for the individual? So I draw upon a recent Gleaner article where it says the PMI's legacy, um, his, it, his legacy. And the writer quoted the PM who said, he has passed the stage of needing to win political popularity and favor. It doesn't matter to me anymore, I have to start thinking about my legacy. But what is this legacy though? Is it Jamaica's legacy uh, as a collective or is this the PM's legacy as an individual? So in my own studies, I've found that a huge part of, of identity construction, albeit in a post-colonial organizational context, is the importance of self-interest and motives in, as in expressed in a kind of what is in it for me mentality. So my studies have highlighted the importance of distinguishing between the individual and the collective in terms of motives in identity collection, uh, uh, construction. So who, whose interests do we serve? Whose benefit when we are making our decisions? Is it the collective or is it the individual? So the death of a queen has forced us to examine who we are individually and collectively. And this is a serious identity moment. It's an identity become salient, of course, at a point in our lives when we're faced with this kind of fork in the road decision that threatens who we are as people and as individuals. This is also a call to action. You know, and what we're doing in this section, thanks to the organizers of this and you know, for this, this topic, I think what we're doing, we're reflecting on it. And in these reflections are the space where transformations happen, the transformations in terms of our attitudes and or sentimentalities. So um, I am very happy to have shared uh, my views here and I invite us to continue the discussion because as I say, it, in, it is in these discourses that the kind of transformation and the new identity that we hope to uh, carve uh, becomes real. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sophia, for that very thoughtful and theoretically based analysis of what we're feeling, what we're saying these days around the <laughs> death and our future as a country and as a people. Um, oh, somebody else is trying to come in late, but that's fine. Oh, I don't even have to ask if anybody has a question because Peter John has his hand up. So let me say to Peter John, speak up. I'm gonna take you up. I'm gonna take your hand down and, oh dear. Okay, thank you very oh, there you much. Go. There you are, uh, great. Okay, um, just a, a few comments. Um, first to Professor Hamilton. Uh, who was the monarch at the time when Britain conquered Jamaica? Um, and, well, I'll, I'll answer. There was no monarch at that time, right? So the, the question I really, I really, I mean, we talk about the British monarch as a continuum over time, but there was a difference in an absolute monarch. And then when Charles I lost his head, the nature of the monarch changed after that. Uh, many things that are conducted in the name of the king have very little to do with the king. So for instance, in Jamaica, when you get a summons to appear in front of the court, uh, up until recently, it was Regina versus Peter John Gordon. Now I guess it will be Rex versus Peter John Gordon. The king or the queen has absolutely nothing to do with that. There is a difference between a de jure and de facto um, head of state. Now, de jure, it, it is an English monarch, but in terms of people's perception in Jamaica, I don't think people see the, the monarch as the true head of state. Now, I, I appreciate that um, symbolism is important, and I'd be all for moving uh, to a Jamaican head of state, but the more pressing and important issue is the issue of the final court of, of justice. Uh, where we still are relying on an English court 
as our final court. And just two other quick um, things. Um, Sophie spoke about the Commonwealth. Well, the Commonwealth is 56, a, a collection of 56 countries that, including some which were never ruled by the British. It's about a third of the world's population. So there's nothing wrong in us wanting to exercise some leadership in, in that collection. And the issue about um, you know, people being sad when the, when the Queen passes, people sad when Michael Jackson passed, people have an affinity to other people who they've never met in their life for whatever reason. I can't explain it, but I'm sure there are others who can. That's my contribution. Thanks, Peter John. Does um, Prof Hamilton want to respond? And does Sophia want to respond? Just quickly, I would say I, I agree that um, the matter of the um, retaining our final appellate jurisdiction in the UK is an issue. We need to settle this. And, and I think that um, it, it's part of the process of us trying to um, define a future that makes sense for our reality in a modern world. Um, we have to adjudicate issues through the lens of our own understanding of who we are as a people and the challenges that we face. And the idea that somehow we could continue to go to a jurisdiction that has had such a painful history for us is truly tra challenging. So, so I agree with that. And I think by extension, I would say, the debate should be less about any quarrel we have with the royalty. I, I, I think we need to just get rid of this arrangement and focus our attention on what it takes to transform our society and address the contemporary problems that we face. Thanks, Prof. Uh, Sophie, do you want to respond to Peter John? Um, just to say that symbolism does matter. And what we know from the business of identity is that it's, it's very messy. And to create this, this new entity and, and to figure out what we want, it has to be a part of the discussion. So yes, um, the issue of separating the, the royalty and the monarchy is important. Um, in a real, in a theoretical way, but for the people who are going to be signing those, you know, um, the, 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 the referendum for um, the separation, we have to take their sentimentalities into account. So, so that's my, my response. And Sophia, and I see that Michael has his hand up. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, um, Peter, Peter John raised uh, some very good points. And essentially, um, we are in a situation where we must separate the monarchy, British monarchy as an institution from those of individual monarchs. I said that before. So we're looking, we look at the institution. What is the legacy of that institution? And as I said, conquest, empire, slavery, and all of that stuff. But very importantly, we need to cut the umbilical cord. So have removing the Privy Council and going for the Caribbean Court of Justice, we don't have enough confidence in our own institutions. See, the, 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 the colonial mindset is still with us. So we have to decolonize the minds, decolonize the institutions, and when necessary, create new institutions. It sounds radical but that's what we need to really become emancipated. All right, that's, that was um, just in response to something that John, Peter John said, thank you. Thanks, Michael. So um, I'm again opening up the floor for comments. I called out our New Zealand listeners on purpose at the very beginning of this session, hoping that they will have some comments to make based on the New Zealand reaction. And when I say the New Zealand reaction, I mean, you know, how the different populations within New Zealand reacted to the death of the, the death of the Queen. So I'm hoping we'll hear from we'll hear from some people about that. Um, in the meantime, are there any other comments to be made or questions to be asked? If if I may. Yes. 
No, well, certainly, let me go ahead and give. Um, her hand is up. Okay, so I'll, I'll go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Brock. I'll go to Shireen. Yes, Shireen. <laughs> right. I just want to make it clear that I cannot represent the New Zealand voice. Right. <laughs> this is this is just a question from Shireen. Um, I heard coming out of Sophia's speech a question of what comes first to the chicken or the egg? And I heard it again in Michael's response just now. Um, is, the, is it that there's no identity? We, we have to formulate a, a Jamaican identity. We have to know who we are as a people outside of the crown before we, we, we step into this complete independence or do we need to make the move of severing the ties and then as the, the chips fall, we figure out then who we are. I'd love to hear, especially Rosalie's response to that, but anyone else? Thanks, Shireen. Yeah. Prof, would you like to take yeah. that? You know, I, uh, I think let's, let's look at this question of who we are. Yes, yeah, complex. I understand the challenges. I, I actually was going to make a point and I'll just make it now quickly. Um, about um, the statement that was made by Ashley about wanting to de-emphasize her blackness. I was struck by that because it, it speaks to the problem that, that it's, we're in a society that somehow um, has a problem with who we are and how we look and how we express ourselves at our hair or skin tone and, and, and so on. And therein lies the challenge in terms of um, this matter of identity. But, you know, I have to say that when I look at, um, you know, those of us who've really fought this fight, it was anchored on a clear sense of self, you know, of who we are and why we're in this fight. Um, and it's, it's surrounding the issues of our humanity. You know, um, the, the struggles of pursuing independent development, the struggles of, um, you know, coming out of slavery into um, to independence and so on has been that kind of singular focus on um, creating a society um, in which we can be who we are and not feel ashamed. And importantly, um, do the things that every human being wants to do to you know, create a standard of living that can provide for yourself and your family and so on. And so I, I think that um, I don't know if you can settle this issue in any way before we act. We're all human beings in a world. We're confronted with problems. I think the important thing to grasp is the um, extent to which we interpret the problems that we face and how we react to them. We can either wait for others to find solutions to those problems, we, we tend to see that a lot in the way we solve our economic problems, for example. You know, we, we think it's important to have these big foreign direct investments because, you know, somehow foreigners have better answers and solutions than we have. Um, and the, uh, the alternative approach and the approach where if we look good, we see better successes are, the, the, are when we find and we find solutions and we try to solve problems through our own lenses. We didn't try to recreate European music. We created our own, you know? We didn't continue to go to the US to um, develop our athletic prowess. We, we set up our own institutions and the rest is history. And so I, I think, the, the creative cultural capacity that we have, that we know we need to do much more with. And the, the certainty and the positiveness that we have in those spheres is what I think we need to build on. 
And I, I, the more we do it, the more it helps in that redefinition of self. Because when we see the successes and we feel the pride as we do every Olympics, um, when we hear our music, that begins, that, 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 that continues that process of um, defining who we are and enabling us to take our place in the world. Thanks a lot, Prof. And I see that we have two more hands up. So I'm going to go to John first. Go ahead, John Shorter. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. We okay. Can. Hi, everybody. Um, I used to be in this department. <laughs> I'm now in the history and archaeology department as an MA in public history candidate. And um, just listening to some of the presentations and comments and questions, I think um, there's like a question that I think that um, most people took for granted, you know, when um, coming to a seminar like this is like, you know, why is it important that these feelings and theorizations are being voiced like right now? What does the death of Elizabeth, you know, what does that directly have to do with these questions about, you know, identity and um, equality and, and post-colonialism? And I think, you know, it stretches back to, um, you know, how how much of a limited understanding I think most people have in uh, how monarchies were actually formed and how they function. Because um, I see within the arguments that we're having here, people talking about, you know, the actual economic um, injustices and, um, and political prejudices that were perpetuated by the monarchy as, you know, as, as, as a reason to get rid of them. And then we have people not understanding you know, the symbolic aspect of it, but you have to also understand that monarchy works actually as both, it is both institution and symbol. You know, it is the embodiment and a genealogical tract of a nation's history. You know, each of these people that takes seat on the throne is supposed to be a link in a chain that, you know, reasserts British identity, English and then British identity and British dominance. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, a coincidence that we're having, I'm trying to say it, we're having these conversations at this point, at, at this point in time, you know, when, when the wheel has turned again, and there's a new monarch on the throne, you know, we're being confronted with the actual realities of a system that seems to have passed its prime in most of the world, you know, how many monarchies, you know, actually do continue to exist, you know, there are only 10 left in Europe, uh, a couple in Asia, and even fewer in fewer that are recognized in parts of Africa and, um, and both the Americas. So what is it about the British monarchy that has allowed it to persist, you know, throughout these revolutions, throughout these world wars, throughout these financial and economic crises? And then how does that then impact our identities as emerging nations and people trying to, you know, overcome and um, and understand these traumatic histories and move forward with our national trajectory. And I think what we have to understand, you know, is that that's kind of what I was trying to say that that, that we have to tackle this issue from both ends. It is both institutional and symbolic. You know, the monarchy has built itself up in its most basic terms. It's it's supposed to be the way in which God graces and sanctifies the earth, and they you know have some sort of live by some sort of example. And each of the lives of these kings and queens that have taken their turn on the British throne have, have had reverberating impacts in how you know, the empire and then its commonwealth nations have emerged and, um, and the sort of geopolitics that went into our development and continue to shape world politics to this day. So I think we'll be kind of like a miss in trying to look at these identities as something that is separate, that we either need to ask for the money in reparations and just do that or we have to look at what the monarchy represents i think we have to always have them integrated i think at the same time because that's the kind of like role in which monarchy and the rolling of you know these people on the throne has has played in our lives you know um John, so i think that's jump. me <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think, I think the point you're making is very good. And I would also add to that, that I think we also do need to actually see um, the monarch as an individual, actually. And we can do that as well, because there are lots of stories about how the, the, the woman herself, Queen Elizabeth herself, engaged, for example, with people of color and, and, and fellow Brits, you know? So I think, I think all of those things need to be rolled into how we're going to understand the monarchy and what we do next. But I just, I, so thank you very much for your comment. And I want to make sure I get to Ashley, who's been patiently waiting as well. Go ahead, Ashley. Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much to the organizers for organizing this great event. Um, I really just wanted to touch on Ashley's, uh, my namesakes, um, on Freud's presentation. I thought it was really good um, and a particular section in it when she was talking about young people's responses to Queen Elizabeth's death. The young man you said um, who had to take some time off because he was grieving was that was particularly um, surprising for me because I mean a lot of people I was I decided I was on watching the internet space, particularly on Twitter, um, just to see the different reactions of uh, people. And I, no I noticed that there was a, um, I mean, this I'm not surprised by this, but I, I noticed that there was like a sentiment of, uh, you are a terrible human being if you think that this is the time now to be like rejoicing about somebody's death because this person is a, another fellow human being and how dare you, you know, like you don't, it's it's so distasteful for you to be either apathetic or actually like joyous because another human is dead. And I thought that was really hypocritical. I mean, I did notice that it came from a particular demographic. It was usually white people who were um, making these kind of tweets and just general statements. But uh, I just, uh, I mean, yes, I, I think one of the commenters, I think maybe it was the last commenter, um, she did say that, you know, you wish almost everybody in this world a long life, but, uh, and I'm not actively going around asking or hoping people to, to, to die, but, you know, you, you, you have to read and observe what the reality of the situation is. And she was not only an agent of destruction, but just like she, she facilitated and perpetuated so much damage across countries and just nations. And I mean, I think the world, it was time for the world to, to actually rest when it came on to, well, not rest, but just like, to show how they really felt about this person passing. They talk about her impact, they talk about her, um, the duty that she, you know, serves so well and her grace. So another come, um, presenter mentioned that um, with Malcolm Gladwell, but truthfully for me as a young person, it never fazed me. I was, I was, I'm not gonna say I was happy, but uh, I'm not going to, I'm happy that uh, this chapter has ended. And I'm curious to see what the next steps are. I'm curious, I didn't realize how much has changed or has to change because um, of a new monarch. Um, like for example, I was blown away by the fact that people who, are, who were QCs now automatically have to be KCs because of it. Um, I was told that uh, um, established ones can choose to change the name to KC or they can keep the QC, but the one, new new lawyers entering into that that prestigious role. Um, Actually, yes. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to just ask to cut you off just because I don't know if Zoom is just going to completely shut off at four o'clock. Okay. Okay. No, problem. <laughs> no problem. I really but, enjoyed this though. And thank you so much. Thank you. So, Michael, just because I'm, as I said, I'm a bit scared about our timekeeping and what Zoom is going to do to us. I just want to make sure that I say thank you to you and the other presenters, um, especially our invited guest, Professor Hamilton, um, for coming and spending this time with us. And of course, the people who took time out of their busy lives to spend this hour and a half. Thank you so much. I'm being told by all of you that it shouldn't shut up. So how about I give my thanks to everyone and then we let Michael talk. Um, I also want to thank the Faculty of Social Sciences for um, helping me organize this event, being very, very 
quick on the ball with all the promo needed and all, all the other things going on behind the scenes. And especially to Keisha, who um, was kind of thrust into the IT role um, this morning. And she's really acquitted herself well, probably listening right now from her car. So um, let's see, this is Ashley saying that she has a response to Ashley's comments, but she can go up to Michael. Okay, so I will. I understand if anybody has to leave. Um, thank you for joining us. If you're able to stay, we would love for you to stay because it seems like this is getting even better than it was before. So let's go to Michael and see what he has to say, and then we'll go to Ashley. All right. Well, my commentary is partly in response to Ashley, in that I want to emphasize it's about the British monarchy as an institution. Uh, not so much as individual monarchs. So I make a separation, and some people do, and maybe it's the sociologist in me, but we make a, so, uh, a, a distinct separation from individuals and the institution. So what does it stand for as an institution? As John Short has said, uh, it's very powerful. The British monarchy as an institution is very powerful. And on that note, it would be remiss of me not to mention the Rastafari movement here in Jamaica venerate the Ethiopian monarchy above and beyond the British monarchy. And that is very deliberate. It's about identity. It's like, why are you worshiping a uh, European monarchy when you have one in Africa? And those people who are familiar with His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie the I, um, when he had the coronation in 1930, 72 nations came to represent themselves. Even the King George V at 1930, who was ruling England, sent his third son, the Duke of Gloucester, to represent. They paid their respects. So he was recognized worldwide. So it wasn't just a trivial thing. How many people know about the Ethiopian monarchy and its legacy and how far back it goes? It goes back a lot further than the 1,000 years of the British monarchy. Um, so Rastafari are actually royalists, but they're Ethiopian royalists, or let's say African royalists, rather than British. So that comes into the issue of identity, and the symbolism is important in terms of monarchies, very much so. And if you're going to worship someone or venerate a monarchy, then why not um, venerate someone? And very interestingly enough, the government of Jamaica has seen it fit to invite one of the grandsons of Haile Selassie I to Jamaica. He's actually presently in the island, Prince Samias. Some people may have met him and so forth because I actually brought him to Jamaica twice before. Um, and he is the president of the Crown Council. So the Ethiopian monarchy is presently in exile, but work is afoot for restoration of the Ethiopian monarchy. So let's look on things from a global perspective and a multifaceted perspective. That's my contribution. Thank you, Moji. Okay, thanks a lot for that, Michael. So we're going to go to Ashley, who wanted to respond to Ashley's comment. And I see Peter John and, and other John have their hands up too. So this is great. And we can, we can go as long as we want, I've been told. So let's do it. Okay, Ashley. Yes, thank you so much, Moji, and thank you to my namesake for, <laughs> for making those comments. Most definitely, I, I can understand your sentiment. I too, I wouldn't say that I rejoice at the Queen's passing, but as someone who is not directly related to her, the only level of empathy that I really had was the basic level of human empathy whereby, you know, it's it's just a little, unfor it's unfortunate that you lost a loved one. But outside of that, I did not feel any overwhelming sense of loss, nor did I experience an urgency in which I needed to publicly declare how devastated I was. And for me too, it was very interesting to see the diverse reactions to her passing. And I think this, this occurrence definitely underscores the dynamics of just human diversity and how you perceive things happening in our in our various spaces, how we display empathy and our thought processes. And that's why I think it's very important that we um, first agreeing with, with John Short so that we have these discussions to not only understand how people are feeling about these things, but also to drive public discourse and public education of first, because in the Twitter space and the other social media spaces, I can tell you the, the level of hypocrisy and sort of um, 
dichotomy of push and pull of what is right and what is wrong in a space where persons are not only grieving, but are also reminiscing or, or grieving not only for the loss of the queen, but grieving because they're reminded of all the unfortunate things that would have also happened to their uh, distant or near relatives under you know, that experience of colonialism. So it really brings to the forefront or understanding or, or how we should be you know, cognizant of various persons' realities and how as young people, we really have a voice in this space and our opinions matter and can of course shape uh, public discourse. So thank you so much, Ashley, for your comments on that. Thank you, Ashley, for responding to Ashley. Um, now we're going to move on to John and then we'll go to Peter John and then Ashley again. John? Okay, um, so I too, as a young person also noticed um, the varying reactions to the passing of the queen on social media. Um, and it goes back to something that I think I heard Sophia Morgan talk about in her presentation about ambivalent realities and how, you know, ambivalent identities and how um, the monarchy, how we're able to sort it because of, because of these, um, this rupture of identification that we've had with our past as, as people, as black people have been absorbed in this Western world construct and the white people that support it, how we're able to, you know, sort of separate both the monarchy as an institution as apart from its cult of personality. And I remember reading, because as a historian, I, I do have to do a lot of research on these people, um, that I remember reading um, sometime in the 1950s, one of the queen's cousins, Princess Alexandra, she was on a tour of some sort, and she recalled to her mother that now they're not just monarchs, that they have to now compete with the likes of the Beatles. And I think that's something that we have to take into consideration when we look at how modern name monarchies function. It's not, we're not just, you know, calling for the criticism of an ancient, well-established and very powerful institution. We also are coming up against the cult of personality and how monarchy has been sort of enveloped in the late stage capitalist idea of celebrity. People actually like them for who they are. So they're not just a prince, they're not just a princess, not just a duchess, they're an actual person, a commodity, an entity that people identify with, that people feel empathy for, and that people more importantly put money into. And this is the real, and, it, and here is where I think the real work can begin in sort of dismantling these, um, these, uh, these systemic institutions. It's looking at it in this sort of like holistic way and that it's not just a monarchy that has all these links to all these institutions and all these centuries of exploitation and, um, and oppression, but also it's a roll call of people that are actually quite popular, that are actually well favored. When you talk to the average Brit about the monarchy, they're going to recall, you know, the bravery of Elizabeth I, you know, Queen Victoria and Oliver Grace, you know, George the stuttering George VI that led the country through World War I. And these are people that they identify with as seriously as people are now identifying with, you know, the likes of TikTok and Instagram stars and movie stars and singers and stuff like that. So just as how people mourn, I think someone mentioned this, so just as people mourn the death of Michael Jackson, it wasn't astonishing to me as an anthropologist and a historian that people are mourning the death of the queen. She's not just the queen. You know, people have met her. She's a person. There's this cult of personality. And I think we also have to attack the monarchy from that stance. It's not just an institution that we have to, that we have to um, hold to account but it's a roll call, it's a roster of actually very popular people who have managed to weave through society and navigate through all of its changes while maintaining popularity and maintaining the sense of um, identity that, that it has for these, you know, more popular, the sense of identity it has for, for most people within um, Western society. And I think those will be my last comments. <laughs> I don't have to be your last ones, but they will do for now. Thanks, John. I also want to point out, I'm just sticking in my commentary in between <laughs> the people's commentaries. Um, but just I wanted to add to that is that, you know, we, we think that we love the individual or like the individual, but that's, of course, we don't really know who the person is, because as you're saying, it's a commodity that's been crafted. It's a brand that's been, that's been created, even before we talked about things like that in, in the terms of using those words like brands. I mean, do I really know who the queen is, even if I've met her? 
do I really? Do I really know who Princess Diana was, even though I've heard all of these stories about her trials and tribulations? I mean, this is all part of the package, isn't it? So when we say that, you know, we're sad about her because she died and she was a representative of great values, do we, do we know that? Or is that something that has been a story that's been spun for us? That's me inserting myself into the conversation. So now we're going to go to Peter John. Go ahead. Sorry, I have to unmute. Um, yes, thank you. Um, the, the issue was raised about uh, a European monarch versus an African monarch. I think most people in Jamaica would find the whole idea of monarchy um, repulsive because it rests upon heredity. So you have ascended to um, head of state, not by virtue of anything but by an accident of birth. I think that idea to most people would be uncomfortable. So yes, we, even if we have a ceremonial president, um, it is not for our life, nor will his children necessarily occupy that, that, that place. So, and if, if other countries want to have a monarch, that's fine. I have no problem. Um, you know, I, I like the British monarch because they put on a nice show, whether it's a funeral or a wedding or a coronation, and, and we like spectacles. We all like spectacles. Graduation is a spectacle, um, you know, um, and it's a spectacle that we don't have to pay for. So we, we tune in for a couple of hours and then we tune out. Um, so I, I, I think the discussion, and, and the other thing I would say about the monarch as a powerful institution, we, we're treating with monarchy as if it's an absolute monarch. We're, we're, we have voices calling for uh, visiting royalty to apologize for slavery. Our governor general cannot make a statement on behalf of Jamaica without the government's consent. Nor can the uh, British monarchy make statements that would bind the British uh, government to certain actions. So the, the point I'm making is that they, yes, they're symbolic. They're symbolic of the nation, but they don't wield the power. The power in England is wielded by the prime minister, not by the king. Thank you. Thanks, Peter John. Let's go to, well, let me, let me just say that um, Sophia Morgan had to leave. And I know that Prof Hamilton had said she had to leave as well. So if you need to leave Prof Hamilton, please, please feel free. It was wonderful to have you. But if you can stay, that's even better. <laughs> oh, she's saying that she has to run. I do have to run. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much, right. Prof Hamilton. Thank you so much. Right. And you'll see that I, you don't have to stay for this, but I, I repasted the, the links to some articles she's written in the paper okay. about what a republic means, what it means to be a republic. So I think that we should all click on those links and at least for me, I should say, educate ourselves. I know that I have to educate myself on the kind of the nuts and bolts of republicanism. So again, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank Especially you. Thank you. Yes. thank you, Prof Hamilton. Thank you. Okay, so let's go to um, Ashley again um, and uh, hear from you. Go ahead. Hi again. Um, I just wanted to touch a bit on the empathy um, that people talk about um, when that it's that seems to be automatic when someone passes and how it's usually I feel like that same empathy is not given to black people or people of color when they pass I mean you think about uh, um it it has to be like massive social movements like black lives matter that can generate and really call for people to think um, to focus on a, a death or several deaths by black or people of color and for them to really pull at heartstrings and at uh, consciences of, of uh, white people and just white supremacists and we still don't get it. Um, so I feel like people who are victims of uh, um, European colonization and imperialism and all of those things were being shamed into being empathetic because one of their one of their heads of state or one of their icons of imperialism and colonialism passes i think is disingenuous and it just shows what the power structure is and 
what it, the expectations are just because we're it goes back to us being human at the end of the day but when it's the reverse and it's a black person who is suffering or who has passed or who is going through any sorts of you know like inhumane treatment or behavior that same that same care and compassion is not offered and I think that's important for us to pay attention to for so for the people who are maybe on the fence about not caring about whether the queen has passed or the impact of her legacy is to everyday people like an, an average Jamaican we should think that we should look at this kind of discourse and pay attention to what is expected from us when something that is something like this happens that's all I have to say yeah. oh John says empathy is a luxury of privilege and I it it is I think it's really that like that like that but uh, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be thanks Ashley um I'm just going to you just read something up from the chat so I'm going to do that's exactly what I was going to do when you had finished speaking just to for people who don't want to speak or can't speak at the at, um, at the moment Olivine says the stats that she read said that 56 percent of people wanted the republic it's a majority, but not an overwhelming majority. John Shorter said, going back to the cult of personality, I wonder what the discourse would be like right now if Charles wasn't as unpopular as he is. And Olivine comes back and says, returns, not responding to John in particular, but says, in truth, I think that more people are worried about how they will pay their bills tomorrow than who the head of state is. I think that's a very important comment to make. There are much more pressing issues for your average Jamaican citizen. I think that's a strong point to make. And Jillian, just put in a comment here, Jillian Mason, um, great discussion. I think the various views highlights what Ms. Morgan was saying, that identity is so complex, it's messy, absolutely. So um, John, I'm gonna ask you a favor. Since you've spoken a few times, can I ask Tracy to speak? She has her hand up, Tracy McFarland from our department. Would you mind? I'm sure you wouldn't. Good. He says no. So please go ahead, Tracy. Hello, Tracy. Hi, Moji. Thank you. And thanks for yielding, John. Um, I'm just looking to the future. And I think um, probably to piggyback on the various comments that have been made about identity. So I think that with the enlightenment that we have, and even those people who might have been mesmerized by the images and their impressions of Elizabeth, now that that spell has been broken, we have to look to see how we can move forward and, and, and strategically shape the consciousness and the identity of our youth and, and forthcoming generations. Um, I think that part of the, the generation of people who would declare themselves to be unapologetic royalists is because they probably came of age in a home where there were images of the royals. I mean, I know that I went, uh, there are some people, some, some migrants who wherever they are in the world, they have up a picture of Charles and Diana and people, you know, before them and stuff like that. So we have to think about, it, it may be simple, but we know from a psychosocial perspective that that can be powerful and shape on an unexamined level, what people think of themselves and what they think they ought to be thinking of themselves and um, individually and as a collective. So um, in the tradition of other countries that have um, the images and the, the information about the legacy that is is, 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 is more representative of the nation, we, we need to be working harder at that. And at every level, in conversation, in schools, in the media, and so on, be, and even in the home, be strategic about shaping a, 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 a more um, progressive and self-representing um, identity going forward of things of which we are to be proud, things that we are to aspire to reproduce and so on, you know, and, and so with, with that in successive generations, and if we make it, you know, an effort at, at, at every level throughout the system, we can accomplish and turn around this, this, you know, what many of us are critiquing in terms of our affiliation with the royal and the monarchy.
Was I the only person who got kicked out? No, um, I heard everything Tracy had to say. Fine. Um, oh, so so you think I'm so something happened to me? I got kicked out. I'm so sorry about that, guys. Sorry, Tracy. I did not hear the end, but that's okay because everybody else did, and they're much more important than me. <laughs> okay. Um, just to say that Ashley has to go to her class that started at four o'clock, so she will be saying bye bye. Um, but we still have we have three people here with hands up. Um, I'm going to do the same thing I did to John again and to John and Michael this time. Fiona McCormack hasn't said anything yet, so I would love to put her ahead of you guys. Is that okay, John and Michael, to let Fiona talk? Yeah, that's, that's, that's no problem. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Fiona, go ahead. Hello, I'm trying to I'm put my video on. Um, I'm obviously not from New Zealand. I'm Irish, actually from County Derry in Northern Ireland. But I've lived here for over 20 years and uh, Shireen invited me along today. So thanks very much, Shireen. I find it very interesting. So unfortunately, New Zealand has, from what I think, a very irritating kind of sycophantic relationship with the monarchy. So, for example, the only thing that broke our very, very strict lockdown was uh, when the army fired 96 rounds after the Queen's husband died. So um, at best, the response here, I think, would be indifference to the monarchy, but there's no real drive for a republic. And I think uh, that's perhaps also tied up with the fact that it was the Crown that signed the Treaty of Waitangi with Maori tribes. So in some ways, the Crown is significant in terms of the Treaty of Waitangi. So in terms of colonialism here, which is, of course, settler colonialism, the sort of um, enemy would be seen more as Pakia than, I suppose, the crown, if that makes sense. Okay, so if you want to, Pakia, yeah. Pakia means white folk. Yeah, Just, yeah, not, so not, not New Zealand or audience. <laughs> yes, and, you know, I'm yes. so glad, okay, I'm inserting myself again. Just to say that um, when I was looking at, you know, people's responses around the globe, important people's responses around the globe to the death, of Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth, I saw what the New Zealand, Jacinta Ardern, the New Zealand Prime Minister said, but there was also, and I can't remember her position, but a high ranking Maori lady, so indigenous- The Governor Queen. General. Say Governor again? Gen the Governor General who's- the Governor General, Queen. who yeah. was also extreme, ex expressing yeah. you know, sadness and, and I was like, really? Yeah, yeah. And not just New Zealand, it would feel that way, but now you've explained it to me, you've explained it to me that they're, they had their, the, the, the treaty that they've, that they, that they signed all those, all those years ago was with the monarchy. Yeah. So they would see a particular yeah. connection. So thank you for that. I'm very happy that you contributed that information. Thank you. But can I ask a question? Oh my, I'm, I'm the worst moderator. John and Michael, just hold tight. Um, that was, you know, an important Maori personage. Regular Maori, would they, would they feel similar Wait, to that? They, uh, because, because the treaty was signed with the Crown, it's the Crown who are responsible for, um, in a sense, alienating Maori lands and so on. And so we're also going through Treaty of Waitangi settlements. So those settlements are with the Crown. So they have to give reparation for what they've alienated. So they're tied up with the whole settlement of um, Indigenous claims. So if you got rid of the Crown, would you trust... Uh, uh, the New Zealand Pakia population to carry out these settlements. I don't know if you would, you know, so there's that sentiment as well that uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a very, very strong decolonial movement here. Right. Exactly. But the reparations are with the Crown. Yeah. Right. Because I know, as you said, you, um, there's a strong decolonial movement. I mean, there, the, there was a, there were Black Panther chapters in New Zealand. Yes, yes, yes. Black Panther absolutely. Was. Yeah, when the Black Panthers were were a force to be reckoned with, so that's it's, now you're saying that it's quite widespread this this this, this sort of opinion, and I'm, that still surprises me. Knowing even after have, you haven't told me about the treaty, it still surprises me because I know about the sort of the the depth of radicalism that's that was among Maori. Yeah, uh, and still is, and still is, but the, the anger is against settler colonialism. Right, right. Yeah. right. Thanks a lot, Fiona. You know, that was so that was so enlightening. So let's get back to our order here. <laughs> uh, John, you were in fact next, go ahead. Okay, um, 
I just had a quick comment about um, what Peter John was saying about the monarchy not being an absolute monarchy, but a constitutional one. And I just want to say that it doesn't really matter in this case. What we're looking at is how the monarchy functions as a symbolic entity rather than a constitutional mechanism. So whatever power the monarch or persons in the royal family actually have to affect policy doesn't really matter in this case. The Bill of Rights went through in 1688 after what was called the Glorious Revolution. And I was in the middle of the Stuarts, the same dynasty that started um, the, the monarchy's affiliation with the Royal African Company. And successive, monarch, successive monarchs and successive dynasties have benefited from extrapolated and um, creamed off interest from that and have influenced policy and their very presence um, and actions and personalities have gone in to shape the sort of soft power that monarchy continues to have. You know, it's why we're interested in their lives. It's why the queen has a six season Netflix series. You know, it's why um, that interview with Harry and Meghan went viral with Oprah. You know, it's about the symbolism rather than the actual constitutional or lack thereof power that the monarchy possesses. Uh, so that's just what I wanted to clarify. Thanks, John. And then we'll go to Michael and then we'll, I'll read out Zena's comment in the chat. But Michael, you've been waiting too long, so I need to let you say what you have to say. Go ahead. All right, thanks, Moji. And, and it's kind of ironically tags on to what John is saying is that the British monarchy is very powerful in symbolic terms and this must not be underestimated. I mean, in actual fact, it's what I would argue distinguishes them from other European countries, that they have a reigning British monarchy, a reigning monarchy. It ties them to the past. It gives England a sense of identity. You know, they need that in a way to bolster them because the truth is, you know, the economy is not doing all that well and so forth. And they head up the Commonwealth. They are the figureheads of the Commonwealth. So without the monarchy, I think that, that England would be, would, would be done for. It would be a shell, a real shell of its former self. So that symbolic power is very important to them above and beyond the popularity on Netflix and in the newspapers. If you look at the British tabloids, you'll see something on the royal family every day. You know, um, anytime I go to England without a fail, I pick up the Telegraph. You're familiar with all of the newspapers, Moji, um, and anyone who's spent time in England are, ah, you know, the Daily Mirror, whatever, especially the tabloids. It's something about the Queen and, 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 and the rest of the royal family and so forth. What is Charles doing? What is Meghan doing? What is Prince Harry doing and so forth? But that institution is extreme importance worldwide. So even Australia, I mean, Canada, you know, they have the queen or the, or the royal family um, on their currency and so forth. So, so all of this, we mustn't take for granted. So the power of symbolism and the, and, and the monarchy is very important. And that is why uh, Peter John, I think he's gone, but don't under, maybe it will be distasteful for um, the wider Jamaican community to even consider, you know, embracing the Ethiopian monarchy. But for us, it's important that it's an African monarchy and there's power in the symbolism. There's power in the past. It ties, you know, uh, at least one nation, which is Ethiopia, to its past, its Asian history and all of that. Part of it is the monarchy is all part of that. So in, it, it empowers oneself if one is seeking a certain type of identity uh, in any which way. So if you're a, a, a die-hearted patriotic um, English person or, or, or British person, you know, that faith in the royal family can make your identity stronger, you know, thank God for, for, for the queen or thank God for the king in this case. So don't underestimate that um, at all. But the question is for Jamaica, how important is that and how, um, how, how uh, useful is it to us on a practical level by having this tight linkage with the British monarchy. How does it benefit Jamaica? And I would say it doesn't benefit Jamaica. It ties us into colonial mindset, ties us into, uh, it's a continuation of colonialism essentially. And, and we have to address that. So that's what I wanted to say. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Zina, I'm loving your name. Zina Yolene, I would love to know where you're from and where that name comes from. 
You said, isn't a formation of identity based on a national mythology just another part of nationalism? I would think so. Is there a further statement you wanted to make on that? Did you want to elaborate on that, Sina? Um, I'll give you a moment to think, um, perhaps type. Um, meanwhile, Olivine said she's gonna have to leave soon. Um, if there are no more comments, we can wait for Zina to um, say some more. Um, oh, here's Keith. Keith is giving us a link. Have we considered the internalized oppression that has come with colonialism and the glue that the monarchy represents for the latter? And then there's a link there to maybe something that Keith wrote, um, social identities and systems oppression. Is there anything you wanna say more explicitly, Keith, about this? Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, I had to find my headphones. Um, I just want to, my contribution, it's a link to a, an African-American piece, which um, I just shared. Um, but two things. One, um, as I said, the internalized oppression piece has colonized subjects. Um, if we have considered it from, you know, a psychological perspective in terms of a lot of the things that you know my colleagues have been talking about in terms of what the queen the monarchy represents etc cetera, etc cetera. and the second thing that i want to say is um we at a a point a pivotal point systemically where um the passing of the queen all the issues we see with you know the, the revolving door that is the british prime minister and its office um and of course i'm going to link that to the shift from uh unipolar world, hegemonic unipolar world, or multipolar world in creation. And so the, the point I'm trying to make is that we are at a very pivotal point in time as far as the monarchy and the commonwealth and what the queen's dying may represent as we see the systemic shifts that are taking place. That is, of course, cannot be, it cannot be, how to put it? Which, which represents white supremacy globally, basically, right? And so it's something for us to consider um, as, the, as the globe goes through multipolar shifts um, to overthrow the kind of oppressive systems that we have endured for the past 600 years or so. Thank you. Right, so Sophia's presentation was trying to unravel these ideas of, of identity, post-colonial identity, and how, and just and as Gillian reiterated in the chat, just how messy it all is because of that colonial heritage and the dislocation that we experience. So yes, I mean a lot of a lot of what we're suffering from is this internalized oppression for sure. And she talked, she mentioned, Sophia mentioned Hana, who of course has written extensively on this issue. Um, of internalized oppression, internalized colonialism, the damage of coloniality, for sure. Um, okay, if if Zina is not going, isn't able to expand, I think we can probably maybe um, end the session. Does anybody have any last comments they'd like to make? I don't want to cut anybody off. Ah, right. Yes, Keith, you came late. Right, right. So, um, yes, Sophia, Sophia was the last speaker and she, she talked about this, the, the psychology of it all. Yes. Um, okay, so it sounds as if I will say thank you. And I want to say it's a massively special, huge thank you. Oh, Lana. Lana Gray Lasby. All right, girl. <laughs> I love this name. Go ahead, Lana. Or was that, a, was that a mistake? Lana, you had your hand up. Can you hear me? Are you hearing me? Yes, Lana, we can hear you now, yes. Great, I was just saying um, good afternoon to everyone and say, just to reiterate that I think the session was a great, great session, a very good session. And you know, this conversation of this nature need to continue. I hope this is just the beginning of many more things to come. And um, that other persons will also, that advertisement may be, greater that more persons will be able to join, participate, and um, get involved, or should I say, probably um, learn more on this great topic and for us to be informed and be able to converse in this area. Thank you.
Lana, thanks for your input. Okay, so I think if there are no further comments to be made, um, we, I can well, say, oh, wait, Michael, Michael, yes, go ahead. I just want to um, share uh, an article I wrote on this oh. the Jamaica Observer. I'm trying to see if I can get it in chat. Um, okay. Let me see. Okay, great. And while you do that, I'm just going to repaste, re repaste um prof hamilton's articles about jamaican about a, a potential jamaican republic so i've just repasted that so hopefully you guys can copy and paste or click on the links and while um oh fiona says thanks for brilliant conversation thank you fiona um uh, i know that shireen is in very safe hands with you uh, <laughs> and also we're going to do some co-conspiring me and you fiona i'm going to send you an email and tell you what that's about so there's a <laughs> There's a link there from Michael um, with his article on how will King Charles III respond to reparation demands? Excellent question to ask. Um, and we'll see, we'll see what the answer is soon enough. So thank you so much. The extra special huge thanks I was going to, that I mentioned earlier was to all the people who stay here till 4.35. Thank you so much. This was supposed to end 35 minutes ago. Um, so I really take it as a testament to the utility, the relevance, the importance of this importance of this conversation that you guys are still here. So big up yourselves. Um, and again, I want to say thanks to all the presenters, and I want to say um, thanks to all the people in the background, like Francesca, um, Lloyd McDavid, and Shara, who was here for a little while as well, and of course Keisha Sherman Howell for helping us with the IT. And for those of you who came early-ish, you would have seen a slideshow with some beautiful pictures and some wonderful music. That was all done by Olivine Thomas. So thank you so much for Olivine for volunteering to do that and putting together such a wonderful piece of, I thought of a tracking through our history. Um, so thank you everyone. Ashley says it was a good discussion, agreed. And thanks for your contributions, Ashley. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to our New Zealand posse who showed up for us and just listen out for the next full department seminar series and all the best. Take care.